Oh shit. So we are back this time um, with Kupik also online. <laughs> Hello, Florian. So you have the floor for 15 minutes of presentation. Thank you so much. So I will present you today my uh, uh, immersion project plan based on the evaluation of interaction between the small scale species and the elastomeric species present in the embryo chamber which focus on sexual maturity. All the data we present you today are unpublished yet, so please don't take any picture of the presentation. So to start, in the Mediterranean Sea, we have 88 species of, of uh, capsulaginous fish, but more of half of them are facing a night extinction risk according to the US and Red List. The major reason of that decline is due to the particular human fishing activity. So IC organization is a non-governmental organization founded in 2016 in Greece, more precisely in Thessaloniki, and their goal is to preserve the aquatic ecosystem. The Bayer's Catch project starts in 2008 in 20 in the North Asian Sea and in 2022 is focusing on the migration goal. Since 2023, we start to study the maturity of the organisms. The goal of this project is to assess the degree of interaction between the small scale fisheries and the elastomeric species present in the goal. In total, in this goal, we study eight species of elastomeric, more precisely, one species of sharks and seven species of whales. So, to, to study the area of study is uh, the Amrishan Gulf, so it's situated in the northwest part of the country and connected here to the Yonan Sea. So, this zone is very important because it's a natural 2000 zone, but also an important marine mammal, uh, marine mammal area and important bird area. Also, this uh, area is the most important wetland in Greece. So, which species I will present you today? I will not be able to present all the species uh, for this project, so I choose to present three of them. The first one is Aetomilus bovinus, the Gymnora altavera, and the Mystelus mystelus. But why these three species? The first reason is because they are, uh, these three species are part of the use and release category of the Mediterranean Sea. So, the rays are critically underdriven, and the sharks are vulnerable. But why Mystelus mystelus? Because the species are the particular need to be a target species by a fisher, but also an accidental catch. Since 2023, so this year, the Ambration Gulf is designated as an important shark and race area, but more precisely, an important reproductive area for these three species. So, what are the objectives of the project? The first one is to be able to identify the maturity of the organism, be able to determine the life trajectory of them and also be able to identify the nursery area of each species in the Gulf. For that, I have two scientific questions. The first one, the life trajectory of each species are different in Greece than in other area in the Mediterranean Sea. And the second, is it possible to determine the presence of a nursery area for each species in the Gulf? So to start by the maturity measurement, so for the rays, we have to take three uh, measurements, three important points. We have to take the total length in blue, the disc width in black, and the disc length, uh, disc length sorry, in green. For the shark, we take two measurements, so the total length in blue, and the fork length to the tip of the nose to the fork of the caudal fin. To assess the maturity of the female, so we need to open them, so this is the reproductive organs of the female, so we need to identify the ovary, so which is the ovary, and we can see more precisely here. We have an, a uterus here, and here, and I will not be able to show you the posterior visit and the obesical gland because during my internship, I didn't find them in the organism. It's too difficult to, to see them in small uh, individual. Well, the mature female is more easier because we have the presence of oocytes and also the presence of embryo in the uterus. So we just have uh, uh, the oocyte to count them and take the diameter of each oocyte. And for the embryo, we have to measure the total length the disc width and uh, identify the sex of each embryo. For the male, it's more easier because we can use external method to identify uh, the maturity. So we can use the claspers. So when the claspers are not classified or low classified, we have an immature individual. And when the claspers are classified, we have a mature one. Also, we have to identify the testes. So this is the testes. And we have to measure them. So we take the total length of the testes and the width uh, of each testes. We have also to assess maturity an internal method, so we can use the epididymis convolution of the male. 
So if it's straight, like in this case, here we have the epilepsy disease, so we have an immature individual, and when it's mature, we have a big convolution like this for the many. Also, I create length weight tube relationships. So for that, I use a tree data. So the discrete for the rate, because sometimes we're not able to use the total length in this case of the fissure. Fissure to remove the spine, cut the tail of the ray. So we, at this moment, we will not have a good relationship between the length and the weight of the animal. For the shark, we use the total length because they don't have to remove any spine and uh, the weight in kilo for both. Uh, we will use the R square for the analysis. So when it's more than 0.95, so that means we're close to the reality and close to what we observe in the Gulf. And uh, the line represents the first major individual measure. For the creation of mice, so between February 2022 and August 2023, we are able to create two maps. The first one to, to show where the individual were caught in function of their sex and their maturity stage. And the second one gives a newborn individual. So when their size are under or equal of the type we observe in literature. So this is the first result for Itomilis bobinus. Uh, what you can add, so in blue, you have the immature individual, in orange, the mature one, and in gray, the non assessed So we have 37 uh, female and 48 male. Uh, in both cases, what we can observe, we have most immature individuals than mature one, but we have 5% of the female which are assessed mature and 10% of the male which are assessed mature. For Jimora Alpavela, again, we observe the similar trend as the previous one. So we have most immature individuals than mature one. We have 48 uh, female and 53 male. And only 2% of the Jimora Alpavela are assessed mature and 5% of the male. For Mescalus Mescalus, again, we observe the same trend. We have most uh, immature individuals and mature one. We have 20% of the female, female which are mature, and 36.21% of the male. For the female, we have uh, 50 individuals and 58 individuals for the male. Now we pass to the length wave curve uh, relationship. So what we can observe for the female item with bobinus, we have a R square very, very close to one. So this is the good news. So that means uh, the relationship between the discrete and the waste show what we have in reality in the goal. So we are able to use this kind of relationship in uh, the field. For the male, again, we have a very good S squared, so very close to one. So again, it's a good news. We are able to use this kind of relationship in the field. For uh, Jimora and Tabela, again, we have a very, very, very nice S squared. So that means we have a good relationship between the discrete and the weight uh, of the species when we observe them in uh, the ambition gulf. And again, we have always the same trend. So we have a nice S squared for the male, also for the species. So for these two species, we can use the length weight relationship for both male and female. But for mysterious, mysterious female, we have an S squared less than 0 0.95. So that means we are not able to use this relationship in the field and it doesn't really represent what we have in reality. At the opposite, for the male, we have an, a good S squared more than 0 0.95. So we are able to use this relationship uh, in the field. So this is a big difference we can observe in the same species. Also, I mean, uh, where the individual world code, so for item with bobinus, we can observe there are many codes in Antuka and Colonizia, but we can also find some individuals in Menidi and in Kofena and between Boniza and Treveza. So they're always at a depth approximately between 10 meters to 30 meters. For the newborn, so the newborn has a discrete less than 40 centimeters, and we observe two main zones where we have uh, some newborn. We have the port of Antuka and the port of Colonizia. But what we can observe, we have some individuals in Kofena and far away from the port of Colonizia. For I as for Dinora Altavela, we can see their codes everywhere in the Gulf. So at every port we found individuals which are mature female and mature male. So we have all the individual codes everywhere in the Gulf, and we have one individual which are codes in the UNC. So that means we have a connection between the Gulf and the UNC. And we have set the same trend as Itomidus bovinus. We can identify two areas for the newborn with a discrete between 38 cm to 44 cm. So in the port of Empuka and Colonia, but we have some individuals which are caught at other places in the Gulf, so between Menidi and Kokrena, and between Boniza and Treveza. For mysterious mysteries, there are many codes uh, in Colonia 
and around Bonitza, but for the uh, new zone, so with the total length at 40 centimeters, we observe we have one clear zone when we find the new one. So this is very important. Concerning the life history of uh, the species, so for Aetomelius bovinus, the next wave curve obtained are similar than the one obtained by Bessister and Lassa in 2018, so in other area in the net team. We have near square close to one and more than 0 0.95 for both male and female. So that means the length wave relation rejects what we can observe in the gulf. And also, the size at birth corresponds to what we observe also in literature. Concerning the size at maturity, it seems to, uh, in the Ambrosian Gulf, the female, uh, the individual became mature earlier than in other areas in the Mediterranean Sea. For Jinnoa Altavela, so Altuzali and Al in 2014, found no significant gender dependency between the disc width and weight relationship, and we observed a similar trend in the gulf. So this is the news. For the L square, we have the L square very close to one, so for both male and female. And this observation reflects what we have in the gulf. Okay, the good news. The size of birth corresponds to what we can observe in literature, or it's even smaller. So we find smaller individuals than what we have uh, in literature. Concerning the size of maturity, we can observe in other areas in the Mediterranean Sea, the individual seems to become early, uh, mature earlier than the one in the birth. From Mysterious Mysterious, Sandy and I in 2008, finding in the Gulf of Gabel, Gabes, female exhibit greater weight than male at the same length. So that means we have a kind of uh, deep sexual dimorphism between female and male. But in your case, we are not able to observe that because in our data, we have limited size of the male. So we need to increase the numerosity of the sample. We have a good R square for this relationship, but it doesn't really represent what we have in the field. So, so in both cases, so for the relationship of the female and the male, we need to improve the numerosity of the data to improve the result and obtain a better n square in both cases. For uh, the, maturity, the size of maturity, so we can observe uh, again in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the um, individual seems to uh, be made to earlier than in the embryo world. So now we we'll talk about what is the nursery area. To have a nursery area, we need to respect three points. The first one means the density of individual in the area is higher than the density across all the areas. So we have we need to have one area with a lot, a lot of individ of individual than in other area of the gulf. The area remains the same over the years, so that means the environmental conditions are good for the development of the new world, and the shark and rays tend to stay and reach the rhythm for extended periods. So I put Aetomilus bovinus and Jindora Altavela together because we observe the same trend in the map. So we have two areas, but we have small uh, species found in other areas in the Gulf. So the whole Gulf at this moment can be considered as a nursery uh, sorry, area for these two species. But why? The first thing, they respect two of the three criteria of a nursery area. The area has higher density than other areas in the Gulf, and the area remains the same over the years. Also, we are able to find pregnant female during these two years of study. So that means the area is confirming as a parturition area for these two species. So the, the rays are able to give birth in the area. For mysterious mysterious, we have the presence of mature pregnant females, the presence of newborn. So we have the confirmation the gulf is a parturition area and a nursery area for these species. We are able to identify a precise nursery area around the port of Coronesia for the species. But the reason why this area is preserved by this species is actually unknown. So we need to further investigate this area to determine, to determine why. So to conclude on this project, so we are able to identify a precise nursery area for mysterious mysteries in the ports of Coronesia. The whole world can be considered as a nursery area for Aetomilus bovinus and Jinnora altavela. We have significant similarities between the life trend history of the organisms living in the Ambration Gulf and those living in other areas in the Mediterranean Sea, with possible differences due to the particular biotic and abiotic condition of the Gulf. And the last conclusion is this area needs further investigation over the time, the time to improve the number of results and to improve co-results. 
So thank you for your attention. I hope this video, this, this presentation was interesting for you. And I just want to say a big thank you to Martina Cyprian and Yuan Javos to give me the opportunity to participate to this very interesting project. So thank you so much. Thank you, Florian. <clears throat> so we can shift and start with, uh, with you, uh, Kilian, and then we will go with uh, Robert. <laughs> so thank you very much for your presentation. I, I liked it a lot, really. It's uh, I'm a big fan of raising sharks, so <laughs> very, very interesting. Um, I will start from the back. So at slide 20, uh, 28, you mentioned that um, you, you uh, identified these nursery areas, and I think that's it's very important. For me, it is also important to not underestimate certain areas. Do you think are the fishing gear, or is the fishing gear in the area always the same? Yes. And is it maybe, because I could think that the, the lifestyles between the rays and the sharks are different, that you caught less of them is because of the maybe fishing gear being selected for benthic species rather than pelagic species, or do you, did you did you find something like that? Uh, in the dog, they use three kinds of gear in general. They, all, they are always the same. They use twamen net, gin net, and long line. In general, they, are, they, they caught many uh, mysterious mysterious with uh, the long line, but they are not very used in the Gulf or not during a long period. They depend. And uh, gin uh, net and twamen net. Uh, they caught the most important number of animals during the period of shrimps in uh, the Ambrosian Gulf because during uh, uh, spring and summer, they have a big period where they caught all the, they try to caught all the shrimp in the Gulf. So at this case, they can caught a lot, a lot of individual, even shark and rays. But we have also, uh, I'm sure you map, a lack of data because we work with the fisher and they are not able to go in the deepest parts of the Gulf. So we uh, we don't know, we don't have the information of the number of individuals that can be caught in this area because they are too deep and the, the size of the net are not enough longer to go in this size. But also we can have a lack of data because every day we are not able to go to all the ports uh, of uh, the area. So sometimes we can go, for example, at Antica, so they don't, they don't have any uh, any sample, but for example, in Colonies, yes, they can put five, ten, or fifteen uh, individual for shark and for rays. So this is a, a, a possible lack of data we can have. Okay, no, but it, it, it's it's very interesting because I think sharks or they're just caught in different ways. But that, that's that's good. That's good. I have another question. So. You mentioned the Natura 2000 sites. Is the whole area Natura 2000 yes. site? What is your opinion on Natura 2000 and that we can still buy, catch, and fish endangered species? Shouldn't we have more selective gear there or shouldn't we have some sort of mechanism to not catch these individuals? I think if they really want to conserve the fishing activity in the Gulf because all the people around the Gulf live from this activity, we need to make an improved season of uh, catch. That's why the nursery areas are very important to identify them. And maybe the future perspective of the project is for uh, the new world to determine which month they are caught to know the season where we have newborn and the season where we have pregnant female. At this moment, we can prohibit uh, the fisheries activity during a small period just to, to uh, allow to the population to, to come back. And for the people, uh, for the species which are uh, critically endangered, uh, ice organization can can just, when they go to uh, to the port, just take the sample and, and say you don't, you are not able to sell them to the public and just, uh, even if they are dead, just release them in the port or in the sea. This is the only possible thing yeah, they can do. They can do. Um, this is a very, challenge, a very challenging question now, yes. but what if there is an overlap between a very important uh, time of the year, let's say the shrimp season, and the season of this, uh, the, the, the nursing of this, the sharks or the rays? Would you have a strategy to like talk to the people or be, be able to, to, to coordinate it a bit? Sincerely, no. <laughs> because we have the problem, the period where we found newborn, what we see in, and pregnant female is during the period of the shrimp. Mm -hmm. So we are not able to say, okay, we have pregnant uh, female, we have newborn, but you are, you cannot live because you can 
co-trip uh, co and sell them. So this is the big uh, problem. And also, we, it's a small NGO, and we need the feature for the collaboration to open sample. And the feature are very, are very, very tricky mind. So we have to follow them on certain, on certain point to keep a good collaboration. So we need to find the good way, and it's a, it's a little bit difficult. I agree. It's a very yes. it's like a, you're just, uh, walking on eggshells. So exactly. very much, but a uh, very good presentation. Actually. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kylian. Hold on, it's your turn, and we'll finish with, uh, with Paula. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I agree with Kylian, it was super interesting. Um, I have a few questions that we we'll just find them up. Um, oh, okay. um, yeah, my question was uh, actually a bit in line with uh, what uh, Kylian asked about the, the fishing gears. You didn't mention that much the the sampling uh, method, uh, sampling effort, mm -hmm. or much of that. Can you say a bit more on uh, where the actual the individual were actually sampled? Were they are uh, on board? Did you go with fishermen? Did you, was it only in the harbor, the crié, or in the auction? Uh, yes, uh, we have a landing site, so we go directly to the port and we exchange with the fisher to keep uh, the shark and the ray to analyze them. And also we go uh, mainly in Colonisia and in Empuca. We can go uh, with an out on board station uh, with uh, the fisher. So we go directly on the boat and in this time we have mainly a live individual. So that can allow us to tag them and when they are recaptured to determine uh, how many um, how many times it they take to to grow and also if they are ma not mature at the beginning and when they when they are recaptured if they are mature after so this is what we want to do and for the for us we go at two ports uh, each month so we try to keep uh, to to keep that to have the, num the same number uh, of fish. Uh, same number trip at each port to have a good uh, uh, a good data and not to go too too much time at Polynesia and not at Empuka because we need to have an homogeneity uh, in the in the trip at the at the port to the fisher. So that means that the the fishermen that you sample in these two harbors they really fish throughout the Gulf. Yes. The, they just follow the coast because the, you said that they can go in the in the middle, but they just follow the the coastline. Yes. They follow the coastline, and for some of them, mainly uh, in Prevaza, which is very close to the Yunnan Sea, they can go sometime outside, but it's not uh, it's not allowed. And they mainly stay along the coast in the Gulf. Okay. Did did you make the measurement, or it's like many several people that made the measurements? I know. <laughs> In this project, we are two on the on the field, so I have able to stay one month uh, on the field with my supervisor Martina, and we take together uh, the measurement at the beginning. And when I was in remote, I continue the measurement with images, so we can compare at this moment the measurement uh, she's doing on site and my measurement in remote on images to see if we have a lot of differences. And also because when we have a lot of uh, individual during the spring period, this is this is very difficult. To take all the measurements uh, we need for for this species, so that's why uh, we try to find another method to keep time when we are uh, on uh, on the port. And uh, yes, we take uh, all the measurements. So my my question behind it is: Could for one species actually, for just for the male, I think you didn't have. A, I mean, you still had a, like a R square above like ninety ish or something, but not as perfect as you expected. Could this be due to um, sampling, uh, I don't know, uh, variability either between measurement? Because some species are more difficult to measure. I mean, it's not always uh, obvious how to take the, the measurement. Could yes. this be uh, the reason for this for this species? Or? We don't have precise reason of this species because it can be the people who take the measurements. I know sometimes I take measurements and my supervisor take another one on the same animal. So we, we have this um, error of uh, people when we measure them, but we don't have error on the species really. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um... Are the, the, all these uh, elasmo branches uh, commercially exploited or because they are, I mean, they are critically endangered or at least endangered, but are they still sold on the market or do the fishermen just discard them? Uh, 
uh, depend of the market value of uh, the individual. For the Jimbera Alta Vela, they are not able uh, to sell them because they have a low increase, so they are totally forbidden to sell any Jimbera Alta Vela. For the shark, it depends the years, it depends the value of the shark on the market. Um, and uh, for other, so Aitamilus Bobinus, uh, the Batito Shamata, the Daziatis species, and uh, Miyobatis and Torpedo species, they just discard them because they are not interesting by them. The value, uh, the economic value of these species is not uh, enough to be said. They have too much uh, work to prepare them and after to sell them for don't, uh, not a lot of money. So they are not very interesting by that. And do you have any idea of the survival of the individuals when they are discarded? Uh, yes, we, this is why uh, Martina is doing. So she uh, map, she tag uh, the species and they have a STPLM method. So they put a, a, a species in the in, in the tank and we we she stays during forty five minutes and at ten, at zero me at uh, at t, uh, zero we flip them and we measure the time she go back uh, on the on the belly and at 10, uh, 10 minutes and at 20 minutes. And in general, uh, they, they keep a good, uh, a good movement, a good way to flip. So the survival seems to be good, but we need also to improve uh, the data and improve the, the, the technique also. OK, to, thank you. Thank to, you. Tomorrow. Hold okay. on. I'm sorry, though. We, we have to okay, do, okay. Do, do balance, sorry, to get <laughs> Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Just uh, one comment and one question. One comment, and I think that one of your big deliverables that you did is that now you don't have to be invasive to determine if they are immature or mature. So I think that you could enhance a little bit more uh, this very good delivery of your work. And the second question is, uh, I go back to the same question on Mustela, Mustelus. Do you think that there could be behind this species another cryptic species that explain why you will not have this night fit on your exponential curves? Do you know if there is any other very close related species that could a little bit confuse your data? Because in reality, in the mature state, you perhaps look at another species. And uh, now in the graph, we have the presence of only two sharks, so the Mysterious Mysterious and the Carcarinus plumbeus, so a species critically, critically endangered, and it doesn't have the same shape and the same size uh, as Mysterious. So Mysterious is only uh, uh, the shark species we can find in the Gulf. So maybe the, another problem from the species we can have is the fact they are a target species sometime by the future. So maybe the data we have are not very good compared to the other because sometimes we go at the port the fish are like okay we have uh, a genoa but we release them but for we don't know the size uh, they give us a possible size okay we have an idea it's measure 40 centimeter okay nice it's a good uh, good information but for the mysterious sometimes uh, we have them and sometimes they just want to show us and they just mark okay we have a mysterious it seems to have this size it's here but for the waste okay you can you can wait it but uh, the, sorry yeah. they doesn't have the organ inside because they remove them so we have an error in the weight or so and for the mature female sometimes in general we have only mature female with embryo inside so also when we weight them they can have uh, i saw a time that we have 14 uh, babies, so 14 embryo uh, in the uh, uterus. So they weight a lot uh, in the sharks. So they can have also the impact on the length weight relationship. Thank you. Oh, I have another? OK, so <laughs> in your conclusion, you say that perhaps uh, you need uh, more, more data, more information to define uh, the good nursery area, again, for this species. Um, do you know, you do know what kind of all the data you have to collect to really confirm why this area is a nursery area for this species? Uh, for me, we need to take data of uh, the fish we have in this area, if we have a more, a more abundant uh, um, more important source of fishing for uh, Freeze, uh, for trees for okay. species, but we can also add the uh, temperature. 
we know the girls have particular other biotic condition. So, uh, wait. So it's a semi enclosed embankment. So the water exchange are reduced. So maybe in this area, the source of oxygen is better than in other areas. So it's also a possibility. Uh, we have uh, in the deepest water, so it's seasonal apoxia and anoxia. So maybe we can compare this uh, seasonality with when the newborn are in the in the zone. So it's it's in combination of an anoxia season or an, an hypoxia one. So we can do a lot of a lot of analysis to to explain why this area is preferred. But I think the most uh, bigger problem with the lack of uh, budget to realize that, but not also the budget, but also the human uh, the, the the human uh, resources. Yes, because uh, we need to have diver at this moment, but not all the divers are, are able to dive in this zone, which is particular. So we have a lot, uh, a lot of lack of uh, of problem. But uh, I think in the in the future we can do a, a really interesting uh, thing uh, about that. Okay, thank you. I have time for one more question. <laughs> oh, one I will more? come back to Robin. Oh, yeah, go back to Robin. He has a lot of more questions. Robin, I, I think um, you're a little frustrated, so you can have time for one more question. Okay. Um, I mean, I just have one, two more questions. So you actually mentioned a lot the sexual maturity, etc., and etc. Yes. But in the title, you were talking about the interaction between uh, small-scale fisheries and the branches. Uh, what conclusion um, can you can you make out of your study on the actual interactions between the small scale fisheries? And do you have difference between fisheries, or I mean, what can you when you what can you conclude? Uh, at this moment, we can conclude the type of nets we will use have uh, more impact on the species we caught. So, for example, uh, the gypsum so the gene nets uh, can caught more uh, rays, so that can be a problem of uh, depending the season where they use uh, the, the, the nets. But also, uh, we have some missing data about uh, the fisheries interaction because we are uh, here uh, during this uh, this year. Some trawlers are in the world, but totally uh, forbidden. So maybe we have a lack of data about the interaction. So what's the impact of the trawler? In, uh, the, in the Gulf. And, and uh, to be honest, I mainly focus uh, my reports on maturity because it was my role this, this year. So I know uh, what, what are the data about the fishery, but I didn't uh, really make some results and some data analysis on that. OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, and the last, uh, last question, uh, you, you said, I don't know if it was answering your question on your during your presentation, but that uh, if you see that there is some uh, some fisheries that highly uh, some for our target, I don't know if it's a nursery for uh, mature females or for newborns, but uh, you said that you could prohibit some fisheries, but you also say that the fishermen were not uh, totally open-minded. So what are the, well, how are the politics and fishermen interacting in, the, in this area? Do they have the same willingness to, to sustainably exploit the, the resources, or do they kind of fight with each other? Uh, it's maybe a kind of fight, <laughs> maybe, maybe because sometimes when a fisher puts his net, we have another fish, fisher will put his net 10 meters far than the, the net of the other fisher. So they, are, they have a kind of fight. But some fishers are very interesting about the sustainability of the world. So some fishers are very cooperative, uh, so with the NGO, and try to limit uh, their uh, fishing trip. So at this moment, so they can choose a perfect area and not go every day or choose a better condition and uh, try to work with the environmental condition of the world, but it's, uh, it's a little bit diffi difficult. And with the politics? The politics, they don't have any really politics in this area. So it's only only the trawler which are totally forbidden in the area. So the small scale fisher, fisher can just go and fish what they want. In particular, during the shrimp season of at this moment, the, the goal of the fisher is to catch the most important quantity of shrimp. So in, in this at this moment, there are no sustainability in the world because the fisher can go during the day and during the night to coat the night to coat the most important quantity of fish. So it depends the season. It's, it's really dependent in the Gulf. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> sure, well, thank you. we have a very last question from Adrian. Very quick. Um, you mentioned that you couldn't find some uh, organs in the in the fish. Do you know if there is a way to find them or? For um, the, I mentioned the orbital gland, so this is a, a representative organ of the female. So here you have the uterus, the uh, ovaries, and just uh, we have here the orbital uh, ov uh, posterior orbit and the orbital gland. In general, we can find them in very, very big, mature individual, individual and not in the small individual, as I show you, because also when we open the belly of uh, the, the rays, is it possible sometimes we just cut some organs when we remove it? So this is a possibility, but yes, it's very difficult to find them and we need to have very big mature individual. And at this moment, okay, we can see them, but no. Thank you for Thank you. Okay, we are just on time, so we are coming back at 10.15 for from Pisa. And guys, just let me remind you to not enter or leave the room when uh, someone is presenting. Thank you. So, yes, we're all back. Well, I'm all back for you, for Nikita and for Margot. So Nikita, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. My name is Nikita Rose. Thank you all for being here today. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the 2023 seasonal analysis of leatherback nesting sea turtle behaviors and the poaching rates in Pequerde, Costa Rica. And this research was conducted with an organization called Latin American Sea Turtles. So first and foremost, in the Caribbean, there are four primary species of sea turtles. The leatherback, which according to the IUCN, IUCN red list is of least concern. The hawksbill is critically endangered and the loggerhead and green sea turtles are both endangered. Although today we are going to be focusing on the leatherback sea turtle, which is known for its tropical migration routes. It relies on coastal habitats such as seagrass meadows and mangroves. And it's also known to nest at the high tide lines. Although it is of least concern, it still faces some threats and is currently vulnerable to coastal development, tourism, human predation, and climate change. And the population has seen an evident decline since 2004. So today, we are going to be focusing on the threat of human predation. In Costa Rica, poaching is illegal according to the Wildlife Conservation Law of 6919, although it is still a prevalent activity throughout the country, as the meat and eggs of sea turtles are seen as a source of protein as well as a delicacy, and the eggs are thought to be both medicinal and an aphrodisiac. A lot of the local communities in Costa Rica rely on ecotourism, coconut collection, and turtle poaching as primary sources of income, Although with COVID-19, uh, the pandemic created an economic isolation as within these small communities, there was a drop in ecotourism. And in this case, uh, it increased the rates of poaching to make up for this gap in income. So with this in mind today, we are going to look at and identify if there are any spatial factors influencing the poaching behaviors of leatherback sea turtles, as well as their um, uh, as well as their emergence rate during the season of 2023. So as I mentioned, I work with an organization called Latin American Sea Turtles. They are a nonprofit organization located in Costa Rica, and they're working to bridge the gap between sea turtle conservation, society, and economy. They have a variety of projects, including the one that I'm going to be talking about today, and they have two primary project sites. If we take a look at the location of Costa Rica, if you're unsure of where it's located, it's a small country in Central America. If we zoom into Costa Rica a little bit further, we can see the location of the two project sites. The first of which, Pequerde, is located on the Caribbean coast, and the second, Osa Peninsula, is located on the Pacific coast. As I already mentioned, we'll be focusing in Pequerde, which is where about 548 nesting female leatherback sea turtles come to nest every year. So in Pequerde, we're going to focus on a specific beach called the Pequerde Beach. 
And now we can zoom into the specific transect along this beach. So you can see this coastline of interest is five kilometers long, and this is where the monitoring and the identification of leatherback sea turtles occurred throughout the season. Each night, four patrols were sent out between the hours of 8 p.m. and midnight, and these patrols consisted of at least two people, completing a total distance of 10 kilometers. These patrols started at the research station represented by the blue house there, and they passed by three lagoons, Laguna 1, Laguna 2, and then finally La Perla. The parallel marks the end of the five kilometer transect where the patrols will then turn around and do the entire transect again for a total of 10 kilometers. This will last between three to four hours depending on the amount of turtle activity occurring that night. So during these patrols, there are different steps that need to happen. The first of which is identifying turtle activity along the transect. And there are different ways of doing this. The first of which is going to be identifying a nesting female. Although this is very difficult to do because visibility is going to be very low, especially the closer that you get to the new moon. And also the colors of the leatherbacks are darker. And so this is difficult to see at night. The next thing that we can take a look at is the identification of nests. Although this is also going to be very difficult to do, uh, an indicative sign of a nest is when there's a discoloration in the sand in a large area, which usually means that a prior nest has been covered. Another sign is large sticks stuck in the ground uh, along the beach, which usually means that a previous patrol had found a nest there or it has been poached. And lastly, we can take a look at tracks. And this is the easiest way to spot a leatherback as they can be seen all the way from the entry point out of the beach or out of the water. These are characterized by deep parallel marks in the sand that often resemble tracks from machinery. So once we have identified turtle activity, the next thing we're going to do is look at the locational data. We also took a look at biometric and egg count data, although due to time, we're not going to talk about these today and more information can be found in the appendix. But with locational data, the first thing that we're going to look at is the closest wooden marker uh, towards the turtle activity. So what is a wooden marker? It's basically a piece of wood with a number written on it and the wood is stuck in the ground. These wooden markers are placed every 50 meters along the five kilometer transect. So if you start at the research station, you will find wooden marker 101 and going along the transect, you will end at La Perla where you will find wooden marker zero. Next, you need to identify where the turtle, or where the nest location is on the beach. So was the nest made at the low tide line? Was the nest made at the high tide line? Or was it made at the berm? And the berm is going to be characterized by the start of the vegetation on the beach. All right, so once you have the locational data complete, you need to decide what is the outcome of the nest. So was the nest poached? Did you see poachers there? Were there signs of poaching? Was it relocated? Did one of the patrol teams successfully take the nest to our man-made hatchery? Or was it a false crawl? And what is a false crawl? This is when a turtle comes out of the water, decides for whatever reason it's not going to make a nest, and then turns back around and goes back into the water. And this is often indicative of a failed nest attempt. So moving on to the results, the first thing that we're going to look at is the distribution of the nest outcomes throughout the season. If we take a look, we can see that the majority of the nests were successfully relocated to the hatchery, represented in green, making up 42% of our seasonal data. This is followed by false crawls represented in blue, meaning that 33% of the turtle activity we observed throughout the season ended in failed nest attempts. And then lastly, in red is represented by poached nests, making up a quarter of our data. Moving on to the location of the nests on the beach, you can see first and foremost, only two sea turtle individuals nested at the berm. And these are outliers, so these were not taken into account in our statistical analyses. We can see that leatherbacks nested at both the low tide and the high tide line, although the number of individuals that nested at the high tide line was significantly greater than those that nested at the low tide. And lastly, we can take a look at the spatial distribution of the turtle activity based on the wooden markers. Now, this is very difficult to visualize, so in order to conceptualize this, we'll take this 
and put it next to the map that you guys originally saw. Starting from La Perla, we can see that there is a hub that represents the highest number of relocated nests between wood markers one and 10. This is followed by the lowest turtle activity between wood markers 11 and 20. And this area also represents the lowest number of poached nests throughout the season between once again, wood markers 11 and 20. This is followed by a large area, a big sector of the beach that had the highest number of false crawls between wooden markers 21 and 50. And the second hub of false crawls is also where we saw the highest turtle activity throughout the entirety of the season. Following this, we can see two hubs where the highest number of poached nests occurred. Although there, there is a gap in between these two hubs uh, that is characterized by the presence of the second lagoon. And then the second hub of poached nests is also where we saw the lowest number of relocated nests throughout the entirety of the season. So with all of these results in mind, we can move on to the discussion and ask ourselves, what does this mean? So first, with the distribution of the nest outcomes, despite the expected COVID-19 repercussions bleeding into the 2023 season, we were thankfully able to see that the number of relocated nests was greater than the poached nests. For the location of the beach, we saw that there were a greater number of individuals uh, nesting at the high tide versus the low tide line. This is uh, similar to what we have found in the literature, as I already talked to you guys about in the discussion. We also saw that the burn only saw two individuals throughout the entirety of the season that nested here. And in the literature, it does state that there are rarely any leatherbacks seen nesting at the burn. Um, and another study actually stated that 5% of nesting leatherback sea turtles dug their nests below the high tide line, which is something different than what we saw in our study, as we did see a, a big number of turtles nesting at the low tide line. And this could be due to the presence of dune scrubs along the beach, which is increasing with coastal erosion in this area. So Paquerde Beach is made up of 20% dune scarps, and this could account for a lack of sea turtles being able to reach the high tide line as they're not able to uh, have enough strength to pull themselves over these dune scarps. So instead, they nest at the low tide line. Next, if we take a look at the spatial distribution dependent on the wooden markers. So we saw areas where there were high and low emergence of nesting sea turtles, and this could be due to an increase in light pollution, an increase in vegetation, or the presence of dune scarps, which we've already briefly talked about. Firstly, in the literature, it has been found that there's a negative correlation between light pollution intensity and emergence rate, um, which could mean that along our transect, where there were local uh, community housing, as well as people using flashlights, this could have created areas of intense light pollution, decreasing the emergence during the season. Uh, oppositely, within the literature, we, saw, we can see that there is a preference towards sectors of the beach where there is a gap in, the, in this light. And this could be something that we could have also seen during our transect as well, where there were gaps with, uh, with the community housing. As well, there has been stated in the literature that an increase in vegetation can absorb more light, creating a preferable dark horizon, and creating more preferable conditions can allow for an increase in emergence. And also, once again, the presence of dune scarps can create unfavorable conditions, especially if they're closer to the start of the water, which could, could create zones where there's not as many uh, emergence of sea turtles. <clears throat> Nextly, we can take a look at the spatial distribution of poaching. So increases in poaching rates can be due to local knowledge, something called the poaching house, and also closer berms. So with local knowledge, the local community, as it is dependent on poaching as a primary source of income, they do have a variety of knowledge on both the ecology and the behavior of the different sea turtle species within this area. And this could extend to knowing the hubs of where there is an increase in emergence of sea turtles. Secondly, between uh, wooden markers 41 and 50, which was a poaching hub that you guys previously saw, there is a large property where uh, a bunch of poachers communally live and they idle at this area. Um, and this is where they spend their time looking for turtles. And also between sections 61 and 70, it is characterized by shorter coastlines and a denser tree line. And poachers are known to stay within the tree line in order to 
avoid being seen by local authorities like the Coast Guard monitoring the beach. And so if they have a closer distance to the entry point of the water, this could increase their visibility while still maintaining their position within the trees. And lastly, if we take a look at the false crawls, increases in false crawls could once again be due to an increase in artificial light, as this could possibly interfere with the nesting process by creating disorientation to the females, making them return to the water before they can finish nesting. Although another study has highlighted that there is high variability in false crawls over space and time, so it's difficult to attribute any specific characteristics as to why there's fluctuations in false crawls. So, in conclusion, despite the illegal status of poaching, we can still see that this is a prevalent activity in Costa Rica, specifically smaller communities like Pucuerde. And thankfully, we saw an, uh, a greater number of relocated nests versus poached nests, although previous seasons did see the opposite due to the repercussions of COVID-19. We saw that there is a possible preference of leatherbacks nesting at the high tide line, uh, which is supported by a variety of literature, but this causes a little bit of concern with the increase in coastal erosion throughout the seasons, as this could decrease favorable conditions for leatherbacks to come to this area, um, which could impact future uh, behaviors and numbers of sea turtles coming to nest. And then lastly, we saw that factors such as artificial light intensity, the amount of vegetation, the presence of dune scarps and the overall terrain pose as possible conditions that could have an influence on both poaching and the emergence rate of sea turtles. Although an important factor is that we can't base a complete analysis of possible nesting or poaching patterns on one season as we cannot determine the behaviors or the conditions of an entire species or even an entire community on data accumulated from just a few months. Some limitations that I'd like to address throughout the entirety of this data collection is that, of course, we need more data. We would be able to draw more conclusions on the behaviors seen if we were able to look at data from previous seasons. There was also a lack of literature in a lack of literature specifically on the behaviors of leatherbacks when compared to other species of sea turtles, which would be something to look into further. Um, and also there could have been possible mistakes made with the data as the collection of data was conducted with citizen science as the patrols were made up of volunteers. So this could have contributed to incorrect or biased data as well as possibly missing tracks uh, specifically during the nighttime. So there could have been more turtles and more nests that we weren't able to look at during the season. Other projects have implemented the use of AI drones uh, to spot tracks, turtles and poachers which is something that would be really interesting to look at into the future, as this could create or increase the efficiency of the project, as well as the safety and relationship between the poachers and the volunteers. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Nikita. So, um... We will start with you, uh, Robin, um, and before we will, after that, we will go with uh, you, Paola, and we'll finish with you, Kilian. Robin, are you here around? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. It's always nice to, to see some turtles. Um, uh, I just, it may be because I didn't hear it, but I didn't understand the, the main reason for the false crawls that you observe because the proportion is like super high from what I, I mean it was about like 25 percent or it sounds quite high for because given the the effort of a for a turtle to, to go spawn i don't <laughs> expect them to do many full scroll i mean that many full scroll so yeah so the the percentage of false crawls was 33 percent and this could have been due to a variety of factors for example the presence of dune scarps along the beach, as I said, that's increasing over time. So if in areas there is an increase in dune scarps closer to the start of the water, they might not even come out as these are in favorable conditions. Um, also, if there's an abundance of light intensity, it is a rural community, but over time there is going to be um, increases in the population of the community, specifically from people coming outside of Costa Rica buying cheaper houses. 
And so this could create uh, areas where there's increased light intensity, which could increase the number of false crawls. And also um, with the distribution of the data over time, there is some people that say that there's an increase in false crawls towards the end of the season, uh, specifically because they don't have enough fertilized eggs to actually make a nest. So they come out and then decide that they're not going to, and so they go back into the water. Although this isn't something that's actually verified. And so the last study that I showed you specifically said that there's such variability with false crawls over both space and time that it's difficult to draw specific conclusions. And with the gap in literature, specifically on leatherbacks, it's also difficult to make any assumptions on why these false crawls are happening. Okay. And do you, do you have, because you, you, you do mention quite a lot the like data from previous years, but you didn't show any. Um, do you actually have them, or it's the first year that you have something that is so quantitative? No, the project has been going on for a while, but due to some um, situational conditions, I was unable to acquire previous data. Okay, but they, they do exist, you just didn't have access to them? Yeah. Okay. So, but the, the train that you mentioned, uh, are they uh, true, or they? Or do you do you do you the, infer the, the, from what you've heard that that's mm -hmm. the pattern? So my discussion is based on literature acquired from other um, research groups, not specifically with Latin American sea turtles. So I am unsure, except for verbal communication, on the um, uh, the exact trends in previous years. Although I can make a discussion based on previous literature from other organizations conducting uh, studies within a similar area. Specifically, there have been studies in Puerto Beach. Okay, so for the for the proportion of uh, poaches versus relocated uh, nest, etc. Um, this you said basically there are twice more relocated uh, nest than poached poach nest. Almost, not, not completely. Yeah, no, but that, that, that's about this. Uh, does that correspond to what has been observed in other areas or it's compared to this? Because you said like it, it global or it was better than you expected. What so, did you expect? Yeah, so specifically in Pequerde, since 2019, there has been a drop in the relocated nests. So in 20, 2019, 2020, 2021, there was an increase in the poaching, which surpassed relocated nests. And this was due to an increase in the poaching activity, as well as a decrease in volunteers. So the project was still going on, but there wasn't a lot of efficiency during the actual season because they didn't have the proper number of people. So this could have attributed to this as well. But then in 2023, we see that the relocated nest was greater than the poached nests. Okay, and all, all the nests should be relocated. Don't they leave any nest, uh, like to spawn? I mean, to spawn to hatch. Yeah. Is so every nest that we come across is relocated. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Is so, that for the to improve to maximize the survival or just to reduce the poaching? Both. So um, one one example of why we relocate is that the temperatures in Costa Rica are increasing, which can impact the viability of the eggs. Uh, specifically because the, the sand is getting hotter at deeper depths. And so when we relocate them to the man-made hatchery, one, there's 24-hour surveillance, so they're protected at all times so that no poachers can get in. And also there's a tarp covering uh, part of the, the hatchery in order to create some sort of shade to decrease the temperature a little bit, to hopefully increase the viability of the eggs. And they, they are placed in the sand again, or what would yeah. you mean? Yeah, yeah. Control sand. So um, I can actually show you. So when we find a nest, um, we take the eggs out of the nest, and then we uh, carry the egg bag, sometimes the 10 kilometers, uh, all the way to a man-made hatchery. And the hatchery is made up of squares um, where we dig an artificial nest based on the nest that the female would make in the wild. Um, I can show you, if I can get past this, a brief photo of the hatchery, which is... Okay. 
yeah. here. So you can see that we have squares uh, representing where each nest is going to go. They're divided by one square to prevent any possible contaminations that one nest might have. And we try to mimic exactly what's seen in the wild. So leatherbacks are known to create their nests 80 centimeters uh, deep. And then they have this little cave here, which is about 30 centimeters. And so that's what we try to replicate with these nests as well. And then we cover them with these little bags to keep any like crabs or anything like that from getting in. Cool, thank you. Um, thank you, Robert. I leave the floor for all those. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Paula. Thank you, Nikita. Very nice slides, very nice story. Uh, my first question is more general about uh, what's going on in Costa Rica on the two coasts. I suppose it's not the same turtles that they are looking for. Is there any difference in the two areas that are explored by... You can still see some similarities between the two coasts. I didn't work on the OSA side. I know the OSA side has temperately sea turtles. Um, but we don't see those on the Pacific side, for example. So the four species that I showed specifically are found on the Pacific side. But the projects are very similar, except on the OSA side, there is a mangrove ecosystem that they try and restore. Um, and that's not something seen on the Pacific side in this area of study. Okay, do you think that your result would be the same on the other area, or there would be some... No, I think it would be different because, one... Um, the Pacific side is a more rural community, so it's very isolated from the rest of Costa Rica. And um, it's near Tortuguero National Park, which is also a hub for nesting turtles. And in Pacuerte, you see one turtle every so often, but in this national park, you see them laying on top of each other. There's so many turtles. And so this is a very prominent location for poaching to happen as it's close mm. to there. But on the Osa Peninsula, it's still rural, but you have more access to the rest of Costa Rica. Um, I have never been to the Osa Peninsula, so I can't specifically say exactly what the conditions are. But just based on what I know, I would think that it would be different, especially in terms of having volunteers, because volunteers would want to go more to the Osa Peninsula because the conditions are more favorable for people versus Pequerde. Okay. The other question is about the light impact. Mm -hmm. You say that probably the different zone where you see different behavior is yeah. due to the lights. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't show any uh, inhabitants pressure or houses pressure or even tracks or I don't know on this area. Is there any difference, clear difference in the different zone about the human pressure about people that live there, not only the poacher. Yeah, so I, I wish that I had been more observant while I was actually there and documented exactly where the houses are. Mm -hmm. I can just base off of what I specifically remember. Um, in the area where there was a hub of false crawls, one characteristic which could potentially be an impact is that there was a very large house there that had a... Uh, like an outdoor light okay. that's specifically shown towards the beach. And this could have an impact on the false crawls, but I can't specifically say the location as I didn't document that. Um, not all of the houses in this community are poacher based, mm -hmm. although many of them are. Um, there have, in a certain sector of the beach where there was a gap in between the two poaching areas, um, it was right near the second lagoon. This area was actually home to a lot of inhabitants from the community that helped the organization. So for some reason, they like to go out and find turtles for us. And then they would stand by the turtles until a patrol came by at night. And they would be out there until midnight. Like they were, and so that could have created a, a decrease in poaching in that area as well. So did you speak with them, with the people, the local people, and how they try to manage the turtle or how they can stop these activities? Well, so the relationship between the volunteers and the research assistants and the poachers was very interesting because normally it was, uh, you don't acknowledge you, you don't acknowledge us. So when we're on the transect, if I see a poacher, I won't say anything or okay. anything like that. Um, and they won't say anything to me. If I have a turtle, it's first come, first serve. It's my turtle. But if they have a turtle, once again, it's the same. 
But I have talked to other inhabitants in the community that were very passionate about turtles and um, didn't agree with the poaching. And there were actually some previous poachers that changed their mind and decided to work for Latin American sea turtles. And some of them had been working there for 10 years after being previous poachers. And now they spend every night going out and protecting a species that they were originally harming. This is why probably it's very important to have the previous data because now you look into 2023 without any yeah. pressure, any mm -hmm. economical pressure. Oh, there should be some economical pressure, yeah. but not that as high as it was before. Right. And so that would, comparison. Yeah. And that would be really interesting to look at. Exactly. Um, the other question that I've got, it's about the seasonality. You mm -hmm. say that you just look at one season yes. and you probably say, okay, if I look at another season, I can see something different. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea about the impact of the season on the, on the presence of nest, on the abundance of nest, on the, about the biological, the biological traits of the turtles, but also on the community? And I don't know if it's, like, there is a rainy season, whether yeah. we'll have more poachers or... Yeah, so I actually, I looked at environmental conditions that could possibly impact the season, uh, including... Um, I have a slide for it. I looked at the wind throughout the season, the moon brightness, the temperature, and the precipitation, because these were all factors thought to impact the emergence rate of turtles. And specifically, temperature was supposed to be the most uh, influential factor based on the literature. But I also saw some studies stating that moon brightness was specifically supposed to be the most influential on leatherbacks in particular. Although I couldn't find any correlation based on the data that I collected. Um, there's the closest thing I have is moon brightness, which I, I looked at further, but still it's not a correlation. And so it's really interesting and it would be more interesting. Is this all over the year or just during your... That's my season. So based on the days. Okay. So with the small amount of data, it's difficult to draw any conclusions, even saying that there's no correlation without being able to look at other seasons to see if there is an impact over time with different uh, biological variables. And you, what did you expect? Do you have some yeah. perspective or some? I really wanted to see. I really wanted to see the impact of moon brightness on turtles, um, and so I was really excited to be able to see that maybe near the new moon there's uh, more and more turtles coming out, and then the full moon you don't see as many. Yeah, but this um, is within two months. Yeah, exactly. At the seasonal scale. Um, so again, within the literature, there is a lack of data regarding the behaviors of leatherbacks in response to uh, bi bi abiotic characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, I did find two papers talking about the impact of lunar brightness, which is why I was excited to look at it, although I couldn't find any other papers talking about it. And more uh, the abiotic variables, the impact of such on different species is more geared towards the other species that I spoke about previously, although they impact the species of turtles differently. So it's difficult to rely on those papers as well. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it was really refreshing seeing some turtles instead of the, the last more branches, I would say. <laughs> um, I just have a question. What would happen to if, if a local authority would see a poacher? Or would there be any frequent? What would happen? Yeah, it, it depends, um, because the local authority is very difficult in Costa Rica. Sometimes they would come out on the patrol with us, um, but they never actually saw a poacher while they were out there, because normally uh, the talk of them coming out spreads very quickly throughout the community. But normally they would be taken to the station for a write-up or depending on the amount of times that they've done it, put in jail. But I've never seen that happen. And again, it's a very rural community. So having to actually take somebody to the station means that they're going to have to take a 40 minute to an hour boat ride and then take you know a 30 minute bus and then take another 30 minute car ride. So it takes a while to get there. And so that takes a lot of energy. See that. Yeah. Okay. 
another thing on the poaching, um, <clears throat> you mentioned the distance to the to the lagoons as or proximity to the lagoons as a, a thing of like in the area of the lagoons there was more poaching. Could you think there is like a reason for that? Easier access or just the houses being there or yeah, any there, other reason? There's not normally any houses in those area, but there is an increase in vegetation towards the lagoons, which could have an impact as these are areas that the poachers can hide in. Yeah. Although it's difficult to determine any characteristics of the lagoon that could impact the emergence rate of the turtles. Okay, I see. And it also felt a bit like it was like in the middle of your transect. Let's call it the transect. Poaching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Could that be something that would be would be interesting? Like there is more. I don't know. When when do you cross? For example, I I think there are two patrols going yeah, at the yeah. same time. So when do you cross? And do you see? <clears throat> is there maybe a reason why exactly there? the poaching or most of the poaching happens. Yeah, so towards the beginning of the transect, we do have the biological research station, which I would theorize that the poachers would somewhat stay away from as we are right now. We do have like a night guard who's patrolling at night. Um, towards the middle is where we can see some more community housing, specifically the poacher house. Um, so a lot of them do idle within this area. Um, and this also was the area that was characterized by the shorter berms. So they have the ability to stay in the tree line and they have a super easy visibility to the water, as opposed to other areas where the beach is so big, it's so difficult to be able to see a nesting turtle from the tree line. Okay, okay. Yeah. I see. Very interesting. And well, a bit of a boring question, but on slide 15, you mentioned a significant difference between the height Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. What test did you use? The uh, student test. Student test, okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question from this. Uh, going back to the next one, what's the procedure when the nest that you use, like you see, like in the man made nest, the turtles start to hatch? How is the procedure? Or do you keep them out in the wild? So we can't help them out of the nest at all. So when we start seeing heads poking out of the sand, we have to just monitor that area until they're fully coming out and actually crawling out of the nest. When they start to actually crawl out of the nest, we have a bucket with some sand put inside of the bucket and we use gloves and we take the individuals that have made it out and put it into the bucket. We take measurements and everything like that. Once they've all gotten out of the nest, then we take that bucket and we take them to the water and then we tip the bucket and we have to be like... Uh, I think it was 20 meters away from the water. And then you tip the bucket and you let them crawl on their own to the water. Do you do this at whatever time they hatch? Or do you try to find a time where there are the spreads afterwards or mm. temperature conditions? Or it's just uh, at whatever time they hatch? Normally we make sure that the temperature is optimal because we don't want them like baking on the way to the water. So normally we wait until the morning or the evening, depending on when they hatch. And also there's a lot of community dogs, which is a really bad situation if they're running around while you're trying to release them. So we have to make sure that the dogs are gone before we do that. We, we, uh, I will leave you a community together because we have to move with, with Margo from Margo. So thank you a lot. Yeah. Like the sushi when you're like sitting and it's like a panda. So do that with other parts. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, they were. They were. They were. They were. They were. Yeah. So everyone is ready? Hold on, hold it. <laughs> we need to go. Yes, we're all good now. Go. Okay, so for five months, I've studied the mapping of Cisozera around Cap Martin with the help of Lisa Magello, which was my supervisor, and Jana Verdeau. What did I... I don't wait. Where is the... This? Uh, yeah. So I've learned how, how cool Sisters Era are. And Sisters Era, you can compare them as like trees underwater. 
they lost their lift during the winter also, and they had to create habitats. So they're pretty cool. So where are they truly in the scientific world? Their genus is Cystosia sensus. The other is Foucault. If you have a question on Foucault, I can tell you after what is it. And there are grounds of these in shallow deep water, and they cre create canopies. And those canopies, they can have habitats, and they serve as uh, nutrition species, like little baby uh, fish and all. And also, they're primary productors, so they have for the for the coffee. And they're protected from by the burn conversion and the personal conversion. So why is the problem? Why is it so we are, have, are threatened? So they are threatened because they're very sensible to anthropic activity, such as pollution and coastal urbanization. And also herbivores, salpa salpa. It's like he's eating everywhere, salpa salpa. <laughs> then we have also the proliferation of sea urchin. So why are sea urchin flourishing? Because we're killing the, fishing the predators of sea urchin. So they are proliferating and they're eating cystose are. And also the climate change is gonna be an additional factor that's gonna not help cystose with, for example, temperature, extreme temperature. So what did people do for that? They created AFRIMED. AFRIMED was, the goal of AFRIMED was to create and restore cystose A lot of study happens. Jana Verdura, for example, made a study about the, um, the spawning of the fish, the little larvas of cystosera, how did they uh, crush on the substrate? And they, even though the results were interesting, they were not good enough to continue. So what did they do? They created forest skew. Forest skew is to conserve the population of cystosera. The goal is like to develop our knowledge and to know how can we monitor the cystosera on the long term. What is the methodology? So yeah, systems are, are hard to monitor because they're algae. So me, my goal was to know, does the difference in exposure among the section impact the distribution of the population of Montasia and Sigonpesa, uh, two species of systems are. So we studied that on Cap We divided Cap 42 sectors and sections, sorry, and the sections are uh, 500 meters, and they were divided during lab work. And then we're go today we're gonna focus on sector 15, 16, and 17, which is there. Um, so how do we collect when we have a little uh, financial resource, limited financial resource, your lab, your two, how do we do data collection to, have, to answer this kind of question? So you take your plastic map, with your section, this is section 15. You take your plastic table. In your plastic table, you will put the, name, the number of your section. For example, here it's section 15. Then after you put your number of sectors. A lot careful, the numbers of sectors can there is can they can be a lot of sectors in one section because the sectors are divided during the fight work when we see like heterogeneity in the coastal. If there is a change, you say, okay, this section, the sector one is finished, sector two. And then after, you put exposure. So the exposure, I will tell you about it after. And then you put the PV star value, I will explain to you after. And then the death in the comments. And you grab good things too, because you're going to work a lot. So after you have your data, you put it on Excel. You do like you did, for example, sector number, section number, exposure type. This is different exposure so that you can have. The exposure identity, because you know that there is the different sectors, so there is going to be different identities. Like, for example, in one section, you can have two sectors that are exposed. So you say one expose one, expose two. The acronym, remember that. <laughs> and then the score, the brand blanket score. So this is the different value that we're going to have in this farm market score. In our study today, we're going to do use R and plus are going to be zero because it is what is easier for us to study, to do beyond studies. And then after some kind of and the date. Then the cartography. You do your coastal line 
all the total cost timeline manually with Radiger double dots. Then after you divide it in your uh, sectors 15, 16, and 17. And then after you divide it with your section and you put your acronyms. This is the goal, super important. Your acronyms are need to be super clear because after you're going to join it with your Excel file and your Excel file is going to become your mapping tribute mapping tribute of your layer. And then after, you can create your results. And this result can show you the repartition of abundance of Amontasia around sector 15, 16, and 17. And you can see that for Amontasia, we have a very, very important abundance when the, the sectors are exposed. For example, here, here, and here, here. And when we have a less exposed sector, for example, here or here, you can see the little basin. We have a lower abundance, so number. And we can see this for the island. Do you see the island here? There, this zone is very exposed. This zone is not. And you can see the difference of abundance. So this kind of pattern is repeated there everywhere. And you can see something interesting. There is no population there, there, and there. For Compressa, we see exactly the opposite. So Compressa is there with Amundasia, but she's more there when it's not exposed. For example, in the little basin here, we can see the abundance is clear, uh, more abundant here, when it's less, it's more protected, and there. And we can also see the sectors there and there, as we saw with Amundasia, that there were no individuals. So a discontinuity in the population. So this, this um, result is a preview to visualize the abundance that are repartied in each, each sector. So I decided to do the mean of each sectors to give an idea of the abundance uh, of each species in a section. So it's, again, it's primarily uh, primary result. It's just for us to know where our stuff when you want to do pre field work. So in sector 15, we see that there is a difference of abundance of Amontasia. Amontasia is more there than Compressa. In 16, we also see that. And in 17, there is a big, big more difference between Amontasia and Compressa. So how can we, how can we expect that? The, Marine currents, I wanted to speak about the Mediterranean current. For, but since the beginning, I'm telling you, yes, the east zone of Cap d'Antibes is more exposed. But how do I know that? Because of literature. They told that counterclockwise circuits of the, uh, the, the Mediterranean. So it means that the Cap, uh, the, Cap the east part of Cap d'Antibes, is more exposed of current and wind. Then we have Erika Montasia, why do we see Erika Montasia more in exposed part than, than Compressa? Well, because Erika Montasia helps, uh, likes sweet water and is more like in rocky areas and likes strong hydrodynamics. And it all is also very abundant in pure water. For Cistozera Compressa, so Cistozera Compressa, you saw it was with Amontasia because Cistozera Compressa likes to be, it's an opportunistic species. He likes to be with uh, uh, Erika Amontasia, but he's also some, uh, a species that also develops in calm water. This is why you see it a lot in the little basin that I told you about. And then why there is this NA zones where we didn't have the individual. So you need to know, uh, Cistozera is a has a very low migration. So when he's a little baby, he doesn't go far. And so this low disp dispersion uh, rate doesn't help when somebody destroys their habitat or their coastal urbanization. So it means that the baby cannot go very far. That's why we have a discontinuous in the population. So to conclude, to have an ecological diversity, we need to have an, an a, a discontinuity and an heterogeneity in the section means that we have to have several habitats to permit diversity in ecology. So conservation must be in two sectors, in the species, but also in the habitat that it, uh, that it helps. Like for example, when you urbanize all your sectors, 
you're not going to have a very high diversity in that. So, voilà. Thank you. Paula, you open the floor on this one. So, voila. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Marco. It was a nice presentation. I have some questions about the context of the project and also the context of your work precisely on Cap Dantil. I would like to know why to do this cartography at this very low level. What is the goal at the end? You did it. It's a very describing work. But what are the questions that you asked that are not already answer before the question that i ask is like to develop a methodology we need to have a monitoring in the long term and the question of forest cube was to know which population we had left for example do we have where are they which population we are we have and there is not a lot of methodology in cartography of sister zero so this is what we uh, developed the methodology if you use only one methodology so you're not able to compare methodology Mm, we only use one methodology yet, developed by uh, uh, Luisa and Jana because we wanted to test it and see the result. So it appears with literature that the methodology works because it, it combines. It combines with yeah. literature. So it was the goal was just to develop a methodology. Okay. Like I, this, we can go after monitoring more in long term. I didn't catch this uh, big aim. I thought more that you want to to say something about this distribution of systems uh, there. So I miss the finality, okay. but now I understand better. Uh, my uh, other questions, it's perhaps more about the distribution of the two species. And you say that Cystosera, uh, the compressor, has a um, different behavior than the first one. And you... You try to show that in the island, once when it's very exposed, there is a higher abundance and not on the other side. But I didn't see this difference in uh, compressor. Because I, I, didn't, I didn't show it to you. See, ah. here we see it. We have an abundance of zero because it's very exposed. Even though it's, this zone is very exposed, this is also too exposed for a uh, compressor. And here we see the difference with Amontasia. This is Amontasia, so very exposed when the currents come here, less exposed there, but still present. Even though the place up, not there, too much for her. So I get the point for the first uh, species, but not for this one. But the level of exposure on the other side of the island is already too high, right? Too high. Too high. Okay. Even there. You see there, it's too, everywhere is too, too much too much for her because the current is coming from there. So she likes zones like, oh, wait, yeah, she likes zones like that or little basin, as I told you. This is all like very sharp swimming pools and I love that. Okay, this is something that you can see otherwise that in uh, Cap Dantib? Uh, yeah, 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 we can see a lot because there is a particular uh, Wait, like in Sister Zero, you know that at the beginning you have a Montasia, then you have Montasia, and then you have the Pokemon gold uh, species like Barbata, Sova Joanna, those <laughs> ones, because they like the, the very water, uh, water that are very small, that have like a pressure explosion, and they have very high temperature. Okay, is there any competition between the two species? Um, Compressa and Montasia? Not much, no. Okay. And is there is any preference on the substrates? Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Because Amandasia is going to be loved in small, uh, no. for every cystosera, you're never going to see a cystosera uh, developed on an uh, artificial substrate. Never, never, never. But for a uh, cystosera like Amandasia, they like rocky habitats. So they're like the rocky calcareous uh, seafloors. Subtract, and for uh, Barbata, it's gonna be like the one that you see in little basins, which is less calcareous but still rocky. Okay, so at the end, you conclude that the difference are more linked to the exposure, but it could also be linked to the substrate. Sub yeah, but I don't have the data on that okay. because you don't have the different substrate no. distribution in this area. I just have the exposure. 
the type of the exposure and the uh, and the, the dispersion of this but it's planned on the future to uh, not the substrate on the same map also the substrate not the substrate no just the the second the future study that are going to be are more about being sure of which PC we have, so the it's DNA, true. and uh, the reportation, they're going to go to the field again to see if it's truly the species, because cystozera are very, very hard, for example, to, to identify. Like, for example, we've been scardling between Pompresa and Granulata. Those two species are very near, so we need to do this, and after, maybe they can go further in that. But they are near morphologically, but also phylogenetically, or they are only close together because they are really, they look like the same, but they are very distant. Uh, I don't know for physiologically, but I know that morphology, they even the look same. a bit the same. Like a lot the same. And perhaps the last yeah, we... I can, uh, it's about your Instagram. If, yeah. Could you put the Instagram? Yeah. Uh, when I saw the map and I saw the histogram, I don't have the feeling that your error bars are exactly the same for each condition. So I would like just to know how you calculate your error bars, so what is referred to. The... Uh, they're just er error standard because we didn't have, we didn't measure the error and I wanted to have uh, an idea of the error that we could have, though they're just errors on that. So this is a standard deviation yeah. based on the value of... On the, on the mean of it, on the mean of... Uh, I understand. Yeah. So when I, I saw your map, I have the feeling that to have exactly the same deviation for each condition, it could be bigger. It could be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be different. It's exactly the same. I have the feeling that this is the percentage of the mean more that uh, standard deviation. Yeah. So I would have a little bit. And I didn't see any statistics. Yeah, because my data are not good enough. Uh, they're not, not good enough, but they're just... We're doing the data, the abundance on a scale. So it means that that's why I did the warning message on that. The scale of Barbanquette is only a finite. Uh, it's only one, two, three, five. So yeah. to have it's abundance value, so you can have some statistic on your abundance. I did, but I was, I did, but I will, I rather wanted to have the, the data of the, uh, uh, like uh, the density. But in the quarter, to have a very good idea of the statistic. And I thought that doing a statistic in a scale was wrong. So I did a PCI and I did the statistic and I was like, it's a wrong to do conclusion or so without statistics. So I would prefer to have some statistic and say, okay, I need to have more data to be more stronger that I have no statistic at all and do some conclusion. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay. It's tricky for me to, to go through the conclusion without any proof. Okay. Even if you say, okay, my proof are not so strong because I need more data, more value, or something. Yeah. It could be a more stronger message. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margot, uh, for your presentation. It was very, very nice. I have a question on, you mentioned herbivory, so I really like fish. So did you measure the the like the abundance of, for example, Sarpa Salpa in the area when you sampled or you have an idea of if Sarpa Salpa is there or we didn't, during the study we didn't focus on Sarpa Salpa. I know that they're rearranging the study now with another every because it's two different studies. But uh, no, we didn't study any Sarpa Salpa. We're very focusing on the population of Sistosera. Uh, Okay, okay. Do you think there are other factors that could, like, for example, she mentioned substrate, hair bivory, there are other um, factors that could be easily measured that could, in, yeah. that could help you with, with the methodology even? To know how uh, the health, to measure their health, why they're not there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Or in, they're there now, but maybe in the future they're not. Gonna be, yeah, the temperature. Jenna is actually doing it. Mm -hmm. She's like, for example, in this zone of the Capdon team, we have few, uh, we, uh, no, all around the Capdon team, we have few thermometers 
And this thermometers can help us to see the evolution of the temperature and help us to see if there is like like a bit the corals. You measure the temperature and you know what where are the zone the critical temperature. And after if you see a population that is all dead, you know why because you have the temperature that is measured. And I think that also a factor that could be measured easily is the eutrophication strain, see, because of the light in uh, this and also all the chemicals that are, is present in the world. That could be two, three very important variables that are going to be considered. And herbivory, as you said, is also a value that has been to, has to be taken in consideration if you want to do a long um, long term monitoring. I agree with you. Get as much data as you can. Yeah, for, of course. Get while it. you are out in the field, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I heard that identification of Sustacera, as you said, is yeah. painful. Let's yeah, say yeah. like that. How how did you manage or how did you prepare yourself for that? Did you have like a course or, or oh. did you just throw it into the water, have yeah. fun? Yeah, yeah. Jenna was Jenna, Jenna was incredible on that. She, we spent what, and what, uh, hours and hours in the water, and she was explaining to me the difference. Because when you're studying algae, you need to touch them. You need to know them because, because under the, the, for example, compressor, you want to know them. You have to take the bottom of the algae and you know it's flat. And this is how you know that there is compressor. And when you touch a bit the like the, the beginning of the, the algae, when it's a bit like uh, not, uh, you know, with bubbles, you know, that's it's canola compressor. So this is how I said we need to touch them to see the species. And this is how we learn with uh, Erwin on the field. And for example, Amantasia, this is a good part also. How I learned to recognize Amantasia, I learned to recognize Amantasia because of this blue thing here, you see? When it's blue, it means that it's growing up. It's growing up. And it's this particular thing of Amantasia that I learned about. The first thing I saw, she told me that now, you know, Amantasia has the, the, the blue thing. Very interesting. And it's very new, well, uh, not grown, but you see it's more um, strong than mm -hmm. the Compressa. And do you think there could be, like, beginning and end of your internship, there could be, like, some sort of error, identification error in the beginning and then at the end? This is not, not the two species that we are on study. We study like 15 of them, but mm -hmm. I picked two. And yeah, of course, for example, we have Barbata, Sauvage so Joanna, those are super close screening tests. So yeah, we need the, that's why she's, uh, Jenna is actually doing the day DNA because of course we need to check them. It's so hard. So you took a sample as well with yes. you? Yes, okay. yeah, we took some samples and we put it in silicate. You saw those little bubbles that we all used. We put it in that, and after the it, uh, it takes off the water of the algae in it, and then after you send it to the lab. Okay, okay, very interesting. And you mentioned the oh, perfect this slide. Yeah. <laughs> the discontinuation between populations, and I can I can maybe see it a bit between fifteen and six, yeah, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. Yeah. Do you think how many meters are we talking there? Maybe. A kilometer. Do you think that is enough for it not to to continue? What is the range of of uh, uh, the, the, I think spiritual range? Less, yeah, less than 15, uh, 15 meters. I, I was this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I would say it like two to two hundred meters, not more. So you would say that that is already enough to not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's already enough. It's very local. Then. It's like so. when I told the rate right, is low, it's very low. Okay. Jenna told me when you kill a species, like for example, you have a lot of species there. If you kill one population, this, it will take long years and years and years to go grow back. So yeah, yeah. It, one species, one population killed can take years and years to grow back. So you think this, this could also be crucial for the survival of certain species yeah. to yeah, have yeah. your study as well, for example. Yeah. yeah, it's crucial to take notes of where there is artificial sectors and you know where and to monitor after, for example, to also monitor the activity of the urbanization <laughs> is a factor to take into account. Okay, true. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Julian. So we go with Robert online. Thank you, Margot, for the presentation. Um, I think I'm going to be uh, brief, I mean, briefer than on the previous. Um, Kylian asked already about the discontinuities in the population. I'm also a bit surprised because I feel like the scales are very, very small, at least for, for discontinuity. So I would rather, I mean, I don't know anything about the genetics of the of this algae, so it would be actually interesting 
to know if the population are actually different or if they are all linked. I assume there is still some connectivity between the these sub uh, the dispatches and uh, so yeah. It, it would be interesting to know if if one disappears, um, is it not? I mean, not providing any 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 how do you call it? The source and think the any source uh, new algae for the other population because it looks uh, yeah it looks very very cross. Um, but do my, and the the question I had after that is do you see between the different population beside the the, the relative proportion of the different uh, species do you see any do you identify any risk or any uh, state of the population? I I know there is no historical record, uh, at least for this, but um, based on the literature on what is a healthy population, do you have any idea of the current state of the, at least the soup patches that you have sampled? Alors, you mean the health of its best, the, the, alors, uh, we were surprised with Jana uh, Vergera to see uh, this amount, uh, this, uh, a lot of population of uh, Amontasia, because we know with literature that we saw a lot of degradation during Mediterranean and Sister Amontasia, uh, sisters are becoming rarer and rarer in Mediterranean and even in the more in the, uh, Côte d'Azur. So I would say that uh, according to what we talk about with Jana and the literature, we were, of course, it, their species, the, the species are threatened because they're all also in the coastal uh, urbanization. There are all, there is a lot of tourists in Côte, uh, Côte d'Azur and all, no. But we'd say that it's surprising to have this much of Histosera uh, mentasia and Compressa at the beginning. So they're threatened, but not that much because they're already there. So it means that, for example, we. <coughs> We're, we were surprised to see this much of abundance. So I cannot say actually if well, they're very threatened or not, but I mean, it's, it's a bit of the both. I would so say that more monitoring will tell us if the position will, will uh, would be more fun, if they were threatened or not. Okay, because you um, you mentioned in the introduction that there's a pollu uh, pollution, urbanization, uh, herbivory, and uh, extreme temperature. So, but based on what you've seen, there is no, uh, at least, obvious uh, risk or harness on this population that you could identify. Yeah, alors, it's I pick the sectors. I pick the sector of what I study. But for example, the sectors here are very. They're proper to have a good abundance in Cystosera. So for here, in this sector, I would say the health is good enough to say that it's not threatened and might, we can continue to, to keep it. But for example, if you take these zones there or these zones there, there is no um, there is no Cystosera and there is no Amontasia all there. And this sector here, the 15, for example, there is no... Uh, there is a little population. So it depends on the sector and on the exposure uh, pollution of the sector. So for this, but, sometimes, yeah. But the substrate, the substrate are the same? No, so the substrate are not the same. Well, how, you do, how do you distinguish whether it's an uh, impact? I mean, whether you have a, lower, a smaller population because of the pollution or substrate or just exposure? I think uh, this I we cannot say because we didn't have the value. But when we see, we know that these zones are artificial zones because you can see the plots, and here are beaches. So the fishing, uh, the sea store are not growing up there. But for example, uh, and we know there the, the 15, 16, and 17, it's a, a very, uh, very far uh, zones of the Cap d'Antibes. So we need to go on the field and measure. The value to be sure and to have statistical and test and all but yeah i would say like for for us was more of like the the coastal urbanization to know where are the population in the impact and all because sometimes it's, we need to do verification the field verification but yeah the deforestation can be explained by that item like where there is more of people the 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 housing you know because yeah. there is no there is no house or no it's not 
there is no organization. Okay, and the very last question. Uh, you said uh, that the Sarpa Salpa, uh, I mean, you identified this as a, as a, as a risk. Um, is it really a problem? Because I think Sarpa Salpa are autochthone species, just like the Cystosera, then they're uh, cohabit together to co, I don't know how you say that, <laughs> live together for a while. Why would it be, why would it become a problem for Cystosera? Because they, they eat them. They eat them. There is a lot of uh, study on that, and the uh, doctorand of his Luisa is actually studying on that. They the, the they eat them. They're herbivores, so they eat the cysto, and we, we see them. For example, the the amantasia when we were on them and we saw they were like no more amantasia, all cut by the 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 salpa salpa. So yeah, yeah, it, I, it, there is a real threat by the salpa salpa. We see it like the Posidonia, the same those two. Uh, Sapa loves Posidonia and Sisto. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Margo. Congratulations. And you have a sometime with you. Hello, if you can watch the screen. Um, from the students are following. Uh, hello, Kelly. Hello, Yannis. And someone you may know, so Emmanuel. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.